Hello everyone, we are only a few weeks away from Pesach, so it's time to turn ourselves to that. Indeed, there's a whole section here about learning the laws of Pesach 30 days before the holiday, and generally that's the uh, halakha, 30 days before each holiday, we should learn the inyana de yoma, the matter at hand, which is coming up to prepare ourselves. So we're going to jump in on page 356, if you have volume 5, otherwise I have it here on the screen. And we're discussing the reason for bedikat chametz. The Mishnah says as follows. Or le'abarasar, or the kim et chametz le'or haner. On the or of the 14th, which the Gemara spends a couple of pages deciding, is the light of the 14th is actually the evening or night of the 14th. Okay, the Gemara goes into a whole explanation why the light of the 14th means the night as opposed to the day. And one searches for chametz with a candle. Kol makom she'emachnisin bo chametz, and at any place where a person has not brought in any chametz, that place does not require searching. So I learned the Mishnah, I only need to search the places where chametz is entered, and I need to do it on the 14th night with a candle. Now we need to understand why did the rabbis establish the enactment of the dikat chametz, of searching for the chametz. Okay, Rashi explains what's the reason. In order that one should not transgress the two biblical prohibitions of seeing chametz in your property which belongs to you or finding chametz in your property that belongs to you. Okay, we're not allowed to see or to find any chametz which belongs to us. Tosafot though argues with Rashi on this premise and he says this doesn't seem to be correct uh, because he doesn't hold or they don't hold, so they hold it as a biblical violation here. Uh, since on a Torah level, the chametz is rendered hefker, ownerless, through the bitul, the declaration that the chametz should be nullified, which I'm going to do after the search or on the next day on Erev Pesach. If so, why would Chazal need to enact an additional institution on searching for the chametz? Therefore, they say there must be a different reason for this. So, so what says as follows. All of our Sarah both came chametz. On the night of the 14th, we searched for chametz. Piresh Kakotros, he brings down Rashi's explanation. Shalom la'avor ala'av ba'al yara'eh v'ali matzeh. So what should not be violate ba'al yara'eh v'ali matzeh. Ve'kashelari, but this is a difficulty for re of Orléans. Why? Since one requires bitul, as the Gemara explains on Rav Amabed, one who search requires to nullify. On a Torah level, then it's enough just to verbally nullify it. I don't need to search it. Then why did the rabbis establish the rule that we need to search? The Nir and the Re, and the Re answers, it seems to me that even though it's enough just to make this verbal declaration, why were they so careful? They want us to search chametz and to destroy it. Why? Lest I find chametz and eat it. Okay, if I was to find chametz on the holiday, perhaps I'm going to end up eating chametz on Pesach. And it's brought down, v'chen mashma lekama, as we see on Yudam Bet, to ba'e rava, rava wanted to know, if you find a piece of, a loaf of bread on a high up beam, do I need to, uh, you know, get rid of that? 
Or Dilma Zimnin the Nafel for Auntie Nanichla. And I said, yes, why? Because there are times when that loaf of bread could fall and you would then come and want you come to eat it. So if you look at footnote five, it explains Rashi's question is whether one is required to uh, take the effort to remove chametz located in a high place. On the one hand, it's probably never going to fall. But on the other hand, if it does, perhaps the person might come to eat it. Since the Gemara assumes that if it falls, concern exists that the person might eat it, it appears that even where the bitun is recited, where I've nullified it verbally, the concern still applies. And therefore, the Doraita of verbally nullifying it would not be enough. So I have Rashi who tells me what's the concern. The concern is that I shouldn't have, I shouldn't transgress having chametz in my uh, home. Whereas Tosafot says, no, that's not the issue. The issue is lest you find chametz and then which was nullified. And therefore you don't have the issue of the door right out there, but you, then you, you're not thinking and you end up eating it. Well, you've got a problem there. So therefore, Tosfot says, no, it's to make sure that you don't come to eat it. And therefore, one is required to search even high places where it's unlikely the chametz will fall. Because if it would fall, then someone might uh, forget that it's Pesach and eat the uh, chametz. Again, a little bit far-fetched, but still within the realm of possibility. Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, he wants to come and defend Rashi. Okay, we're doing a little bit of a poo pool here, trying to really understand the reason for this. Some, I actually quite like this in the uh, in, in this in this uh, book that we're reading. It doesn't give us just the bottom line. It really wants to try and play between the way that Tosfot and Rashi answer it, and then another Rishon the Ram is coming to defend the way that we interpret the Rashi. He says as follows: One may answer. But on a biblical level, one of them is adequate, meaning either searching or bitul and speaking and annulling it that way, as bitika alone is also effective. And any case where one searched, one does not need to do the nullification. Therefore, it makes sense to say that the purpose of the bitika, the search, is so that one should not violate bal of uh, not being seen in your possession, as the fact that the sages require bitul following the bitika is only by rabbinic rule. Perhaps one will find a nice piece of bread and his mind will be on it, as it says in the Gemara, lest he find a fine cake, a geluska, among the leaven that he did not destroy, and his thoughts are upon it. You know, maybe Pesach's already a day or two old, he finds some chametz, he can't hold the bag. Rather, this is the essential idea. That which the Torah stated, you shall destroy the chametz, can be fulfilled in one of two ways. Either one can mentally nullify all of the chametz that one has in his possession, or remove it from his possession in his mind. And that is sufficient on a Torah level, even if a chametz that is known to him, or if he did not nullify it mentally at all, then he must biblically search for it in any place that is normally found and destroy it. Therefore, Rashi writes that we search for chametz in order not to violate this bal and bal yimatzeh. But that is for one who does not nullify it. But one who does nullify it, that is adequate. But since this bitul is dependent upon people's thoughts, and they do not have the same thoughts as each other, it's possible that they will be lenient and not remove it from their hearts entirely. And therefore the rabbis felt that one should be stringent and that betul is not adequate and they require betika and not just betika, but biur, destroying it, which is also sufficient on a biblical level or they require bitika and be or because they were concerned that if he left it in his house, he may come to eat it. This is my opinion and is based on the approach of Rashi. So what he's saying here, the Rabbeinu Nisim is saying that, uh, you know what, maybe when he makes his bitul, he's not going to totally say, you know what, I'm going to get rid of all the hamets in my house, except that one note. 
and therefore they make us check the rabbis made us check for it but once we find it and it's Erev Pesach then we're going to destroy it and remove it from our homes. Now Rabbi Akiva Ega the Ashkenazic Achronim a great commentator on Shas and really enjoys Pilpu he says this doesn't make any sense because you're talking about Devarim Shebaled thoughts in one's heart and we know in they're not really considered in halacha to be binding. If so, the verbal declaration, me speaking and saying, I want this chametz to be, I'm nullifying my chametz, even if in my heart I am limiting that one loaf of bread, what I'm saying in my heart is basically to be halacha. What is, what's important is, I'm saying with my words that I'm nullifying it. So how do we resolve this? So he says like this follows. One must answer that the word bitul does not refer to actually becoming hefker, ownerless. Rather, it is just an indication of what is in his own heart. That one does not consider it significant, but rather one considers it like dust of the earth. So since we are evaluating what is one, one's heart, meaning in a manner of revealing his intent, then if that is not his intent, then his bitul is meaningless. So he says here, normally I would say the bitul, sorry, the Darim Shabalev are meaningless. But here, because it's contradicting what his words are saying, then his bitul, the verbal nullification is nothing, and his thoughts in his heart are everything. And that's why the bedika is, is required, and the devarim shebalev are what is considered important. Okay, so understand this. Normally, what do I say? Devarim shebalev, you're not punished for how your heart feels. However, if you're verbally declaring, I'm nullifying all of my chametz, well, in your heart, you're saying, except that one loaf of bread, what's going on in the heart is, is paramount. It takes center stage. And therefore, we have now explained why, according to Rashi, it's important still to have the, the, why the bitul is not enough, because the would uh, the, the thought in the heart would carry him through. So then we have both those positions, both Rashi and Tosafot, that uh, Rashi, I don't want to, maybe the nullification won't be done properly, or according to Tosafot, perhaps he will come and find Hamet, which he didn't expect to find, and he'll eat it on Pesach by mistake. Now, now that we've done all that interesting pilpul, now we're going to jump in and understand the time for searching for chametz and the restrictions which come with it. So this is very similar to the laws of the Megillah. Okay, on the Megillah, on uh, for Megillah Tester, we know that we do it as soon as possible after nightfall, and everything else is secondary to it. This is true also for Bedikat Chametz. Everything is secondary to Bedikat Chametz. So the Gemara says here in Psachim Dalad Amad Aleph, V'hashta Amar of Nachman Ba Yitzchak, V'sha'ar Shebenei Adam Metsuyin Bevatehen, V'or Hamer Yafel Bedikar. When do we search? Rav Nachman Ba Yitzchak says a time when people are in their homes and where the light of the lamp is good for searching. Now, when is the time when the, good, when the candle is good for searching? Says the Ra'avad, Why do we want to do it at the beginning of the night? Such as the Tikat Hamet and lighting of the torches. Why? Why? Because or the beginning of the night is when there's still a tiny bit of daylight left 
it's not totally dark. You know, you go out sometimes after Shabbat, right after, and you can see that little orange red ha haze at the top of it. That's what it's talking about. That's the perfect time at the beginning of the night where it's perfect for searching for chametz by the light of the candle. And the Shulchan Aruch codifies this with Chirat Lel Yodala Nisan. At the beginning of the night of the 14th of Nisan, we search for the chametz with the light of the candle, and we search the holes and the crevices, the hole and the kamot, all the places, shidar v'hachnis sham chametz, anywhere that it's normal for someone to bring in chametz. Now, if you know that you have children who will bring in chametz anywhere, you got more places to check because they will find places, drawers, cupboards, closets, pockets, any way you can think of. You've got more places to check because they bring things everywhere. The Mishnah Burar explains, What's the beginning of the night? Right after the stars come out, there's still a little bit of uh, daylight there. And it's a fitting to check in order that someone does not become lazy or that he does not forget. Now, what are the restrictions to this Bedita? Amar Abaye said, Hilkach, therefore, Haitzur Barabanan. Now, Torah students, Lonichach be idne, the orchard of Tlesa, the Negi Abarsa. A person who is a Torah study, they should not begin their learning on the late afternoon of the 13th, at the beginning of the evening of the 14th. Why? Dilma mashchale shmate va'ate le'anuye me mitzvah. Because a Torah scholar is going to be so engrossed in his learning that he will forget about doing the mitzvah of searching for betikat chametz. I see someone's making a comment. One second. So how do we resolve this? Adam ba min hasadeh ba'erev. If a person who comes from the field in the evening, nichnas lebet haknesset, he must go into the synagogue. Im ragil likrok kore. If he normally learns a little bit of Torah, he can. Im ragil leshnot shone. And if he normally learns a bit of Mishnah, he should learn Mishnah, the correct Kriyat Shlai Palel. And he should read the Shema, and then he should do his Tefillah. Why in here is there no concern that uh, one may forget to say the Shema? The Bach explains that since the Mitzvah Kriyat Shema occurs every day, he's not going to forget to recite it. The Bidikat Chametz is only once a year, so he may forget. Taz says the proper time for Kriyat Shema is all night, or at least until Chatzot, whereas the mitzvah B'tikat Chametz is specifically at the beginning of the night. And therefore, we say we're regarding this specific mitzvah, and I said also for Megillah that's there, although that's also you can do all night long. B'tikat Chametz specifically, since it should be done at the beginning, Yizaher kol adam, everyone should be careful. Shelo yachil b'shum alacha, not to begin any activity. Velo yacha, not to eat. Hashi yachil, until he's checked. Afilu im yeshlo et kavu al yomad, even that person has a fixed time to learn. Lo yilmad ad she yivdar. That person should not learn until he is checked for the chametz. Uh, and then Mishnah Baruch says on this. And even half an hour before the time is forbidden to check, perhaps he will come to get so engrossed in his learning that he will miss the time. And regarding to this, there are those who also forbid, even half an hour before, perhaps you'll get engrossed too much. 
uh, but some permits it regard to learning before, and only when the time of nightfall arrives is it truly forbidden. Now, must one really stop learning Torah if one has already begun before nightfall, i.e. before that half an hour period? Says the Shulchan Aruch. If you began learning on the afternoon before nightfall, one does not need to stop. But the Ramah says, that you do need to stop. And this seems to be the primary position. And indeed, that is the way most of the Ashkenazic Achronim understand it. And again, Abraham says, no. If you're going to do a small fixed learning, which you normally do, then there's no problem. It's only when someone is really getting involved in hard, deep, pilpul of deep analysis, then there's a concern that he's going to get too carried away in his learning. He's going to forget to check. He's going to fall asleep. That's the issue. The Akut Yosef therefore says that people are going to have a regular shiur at a fixed time in the Beit Knesset, there's no problem here. Just ask the Gabai or the, or the Magid shiur, the person giving the shiur, to remind people at the end of class to go and check. Okay, he says that the only type of learning which is really forbidden is uh, when you're going to do hard learning. Now, the Yakut Yosef continues and says, Asule echol suda shall pat. You can't have a bread meal, your with a large amount of bread, before the searching chametz, which is half an hour before this time. And the law for cake is the same for bread, so you can't have a large pata uh, babikistin, you can't have crackers or pizza or things like that. Mutar, but if you have a little bit of bread, then it's okay. So basically saying, if you have a huge fixed meal, again, you could get end up falling asleep from that heavy meal. Don't do that around the time for searching. We'll pair up the year a cup of fruits and vegetables, non-gluten, or those who have nice light meals during the week, not a problem. And similarly with rice and the like, uh, the cafe and even coffee, all those are permitted. But strictly speaking, uh, even after nightfall, one shouldn't really be eating anything. All this halakha is telling you is really take the dikat chamet seriously and try to do it at your first opportunity. What to do if you cannot be home at a time for bidikat chamet? Okay, you're at work, you can't get out of it. Uh, Rabbi Zion Abba Shaul Alav HaShalom writes in his, in his Ola Tzion, he says, If one wishes to remain in the store, He can appoint his wife or his children to search the chametz on time. And he should also search the shop if it requires checking, which he would if he eats there. But if he can't find someone to check the chametz at the right time, he needs to close the store at Seta Kochavim and go home and check the chametz. Okay, so if you can appoint someone to do it, great. But if you can't, then you are stuck. Now, before we go into where must be the be performed, I just do want to say that, as you all know, this year, Erev Pesach is on Shabbat. So we're not going to be doing Bidikat Chametz on Friday night. Rather, we'll be doing Bidikat Chametz on Thursday night, okay? And that's because you're not allowed to do the search on uh, on Friday night, because once you find the chametz, you can't just, you just, you're not allowed to do it. So therefore, we do it on Thursday night to get us out of that situation, okay? Interesting that this one, because it wasn't a, this in Super Mara they don't have that in this package, okay? But just to your notes, there's not doing this on Friday night, we're doing this on Thursday night. Now, where do we need to check? So we mentioned that at the beginning here, we need to check any place where food comes in. That means, 
obtained certificate, any place where food does not enter, one does not need to check. Comacon, any place, la atuye mai, what's that coming to include? La atuye is coming to include had the Tanu Abandon, that which our rabbis taught in a Brita, Chure Beit Ha'elionim, Ratachtonim. You have to include the upper and lower holes in the wall of a house that they are difficult to use. And also the veranda roof and a closet roof and a cow shed and chicken coops and storehouses for straw and a wine cellar and a storeroom for oil. All these, they don't require bidika. Then the Gemara says, Am I Rabbi Baruchuna? A salt storage and a storage for candles. They do require searching. Why? Because someone will probably have gone in there to get salt or to get a candle during the meal. Rav Papa likewise said, a wood storage and a storage for dates require searching for the same reason. Okay, so this is the bottom line. You can learn from this Gemara a number of things, which is, You've got to know yourself and know your things, which is if you know that people have gone in there while eating chametz, 100% it requires checking. But if you're very careful, like in my home, we were never allowed to eat in our bedrooms. A bedroom would not require bidikat chametz. But in my house, my children do eat in their bedrooms and therefore those rooms do require checking. So therefore you can say bedrooms, depends on who. If it's a bedroom that you never eat in, then it doesn't need checking. But if you ever go in there during the year, then of course it requires bidika. And that's why it gives you those examples of the, uh, the candle storage and the salt storage where people are going to go in there and grab something, whereas the candle itself, and the salt, they're not comments, it's really neither the dates or the wood, but because people are going to go in and grab something. And Shulchan Aruch clarifies this as halakha, one needs to check any place where there is a concern that someone brought in chametz there. Therefore, all rooms in the house and the attic require bedika. Such a person sometimes enters there with bread in his hand, but wine cellars from which a person does not usually take a storehouse or straw and the like, then they do not require bedika. So, therefore, for the houses, the Shulchan was saying a little bit stronger than what I was saying, saying even if there's a small chance, if it's a normal place where people might enter, it requires checking. Now, what about other places? We're going to get there soon, but right now we're just focusing on houses uh, for a second. Now, what about Books. I have a lot of books in my home. Do I need to check every sefer? Unsurprising, you won't be surprised to know the Ashkenazim are strict here. And the Chazonish says, the Inyan Chiyuv, regarding the concern of the obligation, there is no distinction between crumbs and a nice loaf of bread. Therefore, we should have to search the books because of the concern of crumbs. Even if they are not even uh, up to a kazayit. But others, it's too Sephardic Afron, both of them of blessed memory, they say, this is an unnecessary chumrah and one can just do the bitul, and that is enough. It says here, this is an unnecessary stricture, and one does not, it's not founded in halakha, and one does not need to be concerned at all about this. Okay? And therefore one is allowed to learn on Pesach without checking his sefarim or her sefarim, and they are happy to do so. I've shown either in his English work on the halachot of Pesach, brings the Chazonish, as well as the in-between opinion of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Uh, Rav Ida also adds that the Birkonim, or the benchers and the like, are often used near Chametz. They should be sold, since they're often very difficult to clean. And I agree, we put away our Birkonim uh, for Pesach, 
and bring out just special ones for Pesach, and they're part of what we sell. But that doesn't. But that's just those. Everything else, all our other books, we're not worried about. Now, one of you asked, what about searching one's car during Bedikat Chametz? Mishi yeshlo mechonit pratit. Someone has their own car. Tzarich libdaka belad yodal le'ohanei. To search for it on the night of the 14th. As the rabbis establish, you've already checked your car before the night of the 14th. And even if one does not wish to use the car on any of the days of Pesach, you still need to search for chametz. Similarly, public buses and airplanes belong to the Israeli owned airlines, must search for chametz on the night of the 14th, even if it's cleaned well beforehand. And nevertheless, when one searches one car, you do not make the beracha of al or chametz again. Rather, the beracha, which you did at home, that covers everything. And you have in mind, you're going to search the cars as well. What about synagogues? Says the Shulchan Aruch, batei kenesiyot, batei midrashot, Also, synagogues and houses of learning, they require checking. Why? Those kiddies. Because the kids keep bringing in chametz into them. And on the night of the 14th by candle, the Mishnah Burah says, uh, but the attendants are not careful to search at night, but just sweep well during the day, but they are not acting properly. I almost warn them that they should fulfill the mitzvah of the sages and do it. Now, just so you know, this always falls on me. This is one where the rabbi really gets paid well. After I've checked my house and after I've checked my cars, then I go to the synagogue and make sure all the chametz is gone. Shulchan Aruch says about this. Uh, if one has spent much time thoroughly cleaning the entire house in the days and weeks before Pesach, according to the Shulchan Aruch, it seems that even in this case, Vidikat Chametz must still be performed on the night of the 14th. As he says, Hamechabed Chadrav Yed Gimel Benisan, Mechaven Lebdok Hechametz, Ulevaro, Mizar Shalalachnish Sham Od Chametz, Afa Pichain, Tsarich Lebdok Belel Yodal. Even though everything is thoroughly clean way before then, on the 13th, the house is clean. They are already cooking for Pesach. Nevertheless, you still need to check on the night of the 14th. And everyone must sweep his room prior to the bidika and his pockets of his clothing, which one occasionally puts chametz. All that requires searching. Despite the fact that one must still perform a bidika, nowadays many poskim, including Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach, suggest that the manner in which the bidika is done after cleaning their house may indeed be different than how it was originally performed. He writes, but in our times, when we sweep and clean extremely well, there is no obligation to carefully inspect every single place in the house during the bidika. And that has already been done when they clean during the days prior to Pesach. The obligation of Bidikar in our times is to check carefully and evaluate whether they should be cleaned, indeed cleaned, that they were indeed cleaned well. And this is also the opinion of Rav Yosef Shalom El Yashiv. Okay. And the Shari Chuba here also mentions a similar custom of searching quickly during the Bidika without carefully inspecting every nook and cranny. This is also brought down by the Piskei Teshuvot and additional support for the custom nowadays of searching more quickly throughout the house as otherwise it would take an inordinate amount of time to carefully search. So it becomes more ceremonial than practical because it's already been done. However, since we've seen it's codified in Halakha, we still do so and Obviously, we're making the beracha. Now, when making the beracha, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Habodek, Sochi the one who's searching, must make the beracha. My mevarech, what is the beracha? Rav Papi Amar Mishmei de Rava, Rav Papi said the name of Rava, Leva'er Chametz. Rav Papa Amar Mishmei de Rava, Al Bior Chametz. So one of them said, Rav Papi is in the name of Rava, it's uh, Leva'er, 
And Rav Papa said in the name of Rava, no, it's not that. It's al Now, which one is correct? With regard to the formula to remove, everyone agrees it certainly refers to the future. Kiplige, what are they arguing about? The al biur regarding the one who says biur uh, on, the, on that phrase on the biur mar savar mikar mashma. One of the sages implies it's referring to that which was performed previously. Whereas that's what Papi was. The other sage of Papa holds it means it's talking about haba that which is going to happen in the future. So which is the halacha? It's al biur chametz. As we all know, that's the uh, the one you'll find in your machzorim in the zechut Rachel. So the accepted halacha is the text of the berachah is al biur chametz, as codified by Shulchan Aruch. Kodem shiatchil libdok yevarech hashekid deshas avesivanu al biur chametz. And says the Ramah, Vim hitchil if one began searching below bracha without making the bracha, Yevarech, he still makes the bracha in the middle, calls the man Shlosiem Bedikato, provided he has not concluded his search. Shulchan Aruch, Vizahe, one should be careful, Shelo Yidaber, Bein Habracha, Tchinata Bedika, one should be careful not to speak between the bracha and beginning the search. And it's important and it's good practice not to speak about other matters until the search is concluded, okay? So he will keep his mind on the search in every place the chametz is brought. Why is the bracha recited on the act of bi'ur, of burning the chametz, rather than the bedikaz? And why isn't the bracha al bedikat chametz? Why is it on the burning or the destroying of the chametz? Because even though he does not burn it until the next day, nevertheless, since this search is for the purpose of burning, it is considered similar to the bi'or. And that's why the bracha is al bi'or. And one cannot recite the bracha al bedikat chametz. This is not the conclusion of the mitzvah. Okay? The whole mitzvah is searching in order to destroy or burn. It's not the primary goal is to destroy it. Okay? And one cannot recite al bitul chametz since the primary nullification is dependent upon one's heart, and we don't make brachot on devarim shebalev things which are in our heart. Now, let's say I don't want to use a candle. I don't want to get wax everywhere. It's not helpful. Can I use a flashlight? The Gemara says here, Tana. Don't worry, they didn't know about flashlights in the Gemara, but perhaps we can understand it from it. Tana Debe Rabbi Ishmael, Lele Abasar, Bodkimet Chametz Lo Haner. On the night of the 14th, we search with uh, for Chametz. With what? Lo Haner, the light of a candle. Apa Pisha and Raya Ledava. Even though there's no proof to this matter, Zecha Ledava, there's an allusion to it. Shenehemah, as the verse states, it's not in the Torah that you have to use a candle, but there's a hint to it. As it says, Shivat Yamim Se'olo Imatzer, for seven days there shall not be any leaven. The Omer, and it also says, Regarding uh, when they were searching to find uh, the goblet of Yosef, they searched from the oldest, uh, they began with the oldest and they finished with the youngest, with Binyamin. The Omer, and it also says there, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with candles. The Omer, Ne'er Hashem, Nishmat Adam Chapes. The spirit of man is the lamp of Hashem. Okay? Searching all the inward parts. Tanara Banana, Rabbis continue. Ain't but kin, Lola or Hachama. We don't search with the light of the sun. Lola or Halabanana, the light of the moon. Lola or Havukana, the light of a torch. Ella, Le or Hane, the light of a candle. Mesha or Hane, a fella bedika, because the candle is the best way to search. The avuka, but a torch with multiple wicks, law, one does not do. Bahama Rava, but Rava said, Bahama Rava, avuka la havdala, mitzvah mina mulchar. But a torch, a multi wick candle, is the best for havdala. 
אמר רב נחמן בר יצחק, זה יכול להכניסו לאחורינו סדקים, וזה אינו יכול להכניסו לאחורינו סדקים. Why is it that a torch is not as good? Because it's not as good to check into the holes and crevices. It's too big to get in there, but the small candle flame can get in there. Rav Zvid Amar, ze oro lefanav, ze oro laacharav. This lamp projects its light before it, allowing one to search properly, whereas this one, the torch, projects its light behind it on the person conducting the search. It doesn't help you. Rav Papa Amar, hai ba'it v'hai lo ba'it. This one, using the torch, one fears, and one uses the other one, he does not fear. Why does he fear? Perhaps everything's going to catch on fire. Ravina Amar, hai mashach nahara, vai miktaf ek tupay. Ravina said, this lamp consistently draws light, and the light of that torch fluctuates. Although overall the torch provides greater light than a lamp, it's less effective when doing a complex search. So, thank you for the Talmud. How does that help us with a flashlight? Does that help us? Does that, uh, which one do we say a flashlight will give us a spot and so therefore it's like a lamp? Or do we say that a flashlight is like a torch? And that's a pun, by the way, because a flashlight and a torch are the same thing. A torch in English is what you call a flashlight, but boom, in England. So what is it? Laor hapanas, is it permitted? It is permitted according to the strict halacha, to search using a flashlight. Why? Since the reason for the enactment to use a candle is that its light is concentrated, and the light of a flashlight is also concentrated, and there is even an advantage to a flashlight that there is less concern that it may cause a fire or worse. And if it's a good flashlight, it's strong, its light is strong and concentrated, even more than a candle, but some are stringent not to search with a flashlight, since the sages derive from Psukim that the search should be performed with a candle. However, a flashlight could also be considered a candle, since the thread of the filament is the flame and the battery is the oil. In practice, the widespread custom is to search using a candle, as Chazal are accustomed to doing, but the halacha is that anyone who wishes to search with a flashlight is allowed to do so. And in places where there, one is searching specifically concerned that the flame of the candle will cause a fire, then in those cases, it's preferable to use a flashlight. Now, many of us have the minhag of placing 10 small pieces of bread. Okay, how do we do so, okay? We don't want to make a bracha if one does not find any chametz, and there will be a bracha levatala. Therefore, the kolba suggests that for this reason, it's customary for other family members to hide 10 small pieces of bread for the one searching. And now it's important here to make sure that these pieces are small, less than a kazayat. So if, they're, they're not, if one of them is not found, one does not need to worry that they have uh, lost some chametz in their house. It is customary to place, so in some places, to hide small pieces of bread in the cracks of the houses so that the one searching will find them and destroy them. And if he does not find anything, there is concern for a bracha levatala. But we have not been concerned for that, since our opinion is that when reciting the bracha on burning the chametz, the intention is to burn it if it is found. Okay, so even though we're not concerned about bracha levatala, the minhag is still to uh, hide pieces. The Ramah writes that lechatchila, one should hide the small pieces of bread to comply with the custom of the kolba. However, if one did not do so, the Ramah holds that one may rely on the kolba's opinion. The bracha is on the actual betika, not the finding and burning. Okay, as the Ramah says, but no hagim lhaniach betitei chametz b'makom shi yimetzaen habodek k'dei shelo ye birchato levatala. מיהו אינו נתן לו עקב הדדת כל אדם עם הברכה לבאה אם נמצא. And the custom is to place small pieces of chametz in places where the one searching will find them so that his barakha will not be in vain. But if one did not place them, it does not impede. And the intent of every person with the barakha is only to burn it if it is found. The common custom today is to place 10 pieces of chametz out, and the Mishnah Baruch writes there's allusion to this customs in their writings of 
the Arizal. Nice Kabbalistic reason here that the customer wants to place 10 small pieces out. We want to be exceedingly careful not to lose any of the pieces. It's a good idea to write down where one places the pieces in case one forgets where they are. But nonetheless, one of them got lost. The Orletzion writes that one need not spend effort to find it. Rather, one should simply rely on the verbal declaration of Bitul shortly after the Bitika. One who hid 10 small pieces for the Bidikat Chametz and only found nine, what should he do? Other than having a, uh, than having a freaking out, he should, not, so he should search for it and try to find it, but if he does not find it, he may rely on the beetle that suffices, but that only works if it's less than a Kazayat. Okay, now I don't know why, but Bidikat Chametz always, always, every year stresses me out, but just some nice, straightforward things. Write down, the people who are hiding it, write down where it's going to be hidden. Make sure they're all small pieces. Make sure everything is prepared. Make the bracha, do it right after, the, uh, after nightfall, and it should all be straightforward. This year, because it's uh, Erev Pesach on Shabbat, we're gonna do it on Thursday night. All right, we'll stop here, and next week we will continue with Bitul Chametz and Bi'ur Chametz. And we might even get into discussing the uh, custom of Mechirat Chametz, of selling our Chametz, and understand how this controversial practice became mainstream Jewish law. Any questions on this? Yes, I have a question, Rabbi. So, yes, um, yeah, so many people go away a few days prior to the uh, time to uh, search for the chametz, so that is it that therefore that they just uh, do it as soon as close to the time that they're leaving uh, the house. That's correct. They 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 search, but without a beracha. Without a beracha. Okay. And then where they're going to be for Pesach, that's when they make the beracha. Okay. Got it. All right, but this year, and this is the unique situation, even though we're not searching on the 14th, but searching on the night of the 13th, we do make the bracha because this is the last night possible to do the search. Okay, all right, we will stop here and we will continue next week.